Hi, this is your host, Abhinav Bharatiya, and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us once again, Lucas Gently, CEO of Lock Labs. Lucas, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, Swap, well, it's great to be back on TFR. Yeah, and today we are going to talk about DevSpace 6. But before we talk about this uh, version 6, I want our viewers to you know, know a bit more about DevSpace. So quickly, please remind us what is DevSpace all about? DevSpace is a developer tool for Kubernetes. Uh, we started it in 2018. <clears throat> it has you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, users. Um, it is uh, open source, available on GitHub. And it really helps you know, large engineering teams to streamline their workflow with Kubernetes. So effectively, you set up this one you know, DevSpace YAML file, put it in your Git repository, um, actually in multiple Git repositories for each one of your projects. You can even interlink them. And then developers can spin up each one of these projects with just a single command and really easily start you know, deploying the Kubernetes, developing on Kubernetes running integration tests on Kubernetes and a lot more. Uh, it's an open source project, right? As usual. That's correct. Yeah, so can you talk about what are the kind of competing projects? Because you know, a lot of folks are trying to solve the same problem of you know, de develop and deploy for Kubernetes. So talk about them and what you know, value DevSpace brings to the ecosystem. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of projects that try to address uh, development on top of Kubernetes. I think Telepresence, for example, is one of the earliest projects. Uh, I think Ambassador Labs got that started. It's a CNCF sandbox project at this point. Uh, Scaffold is a project that the folks at Google have started. Uh, they have been even, you know, discontinued project at, at this point, like the Azure team built Draft uh, a couple of years back. Um, I think it's a really important issue to tackle. The main difference uh, between DevSpace and any of the tools out there is that DevSpace stands up your entire stack, including your dependencies. So it's not just limited to a single project. It really connects all your Git repositories, all your microservices. So I want to work on one project, and I you know, don't even need to know that it depends on three other Git repositories, because DevSpace knows that, and it spins up these applications, these dependencies for you. Um, and another big difference is the way that you work with Kubernetes. You know, Approaches like telepresence require you to run parts of your application locally and parts of your application in Kubernetes. For DevSpace, that's different. Everything gets deployed to Kubernetes, but the thing that you're working on, we deploy in a special way that starts a hot reloading mechanism for the containers. That means whenever you change a line of code, you'll see the effect inside the cluster immediately. And that's pretty rare. We're the only one that does that at this point. Um, their approaches to kind of, you know, update containers faster, but most tools really rely on building images, pushing them to a registry, restarting all the containers in Kubernetes. Kubernetes is going to reschedule everything. It's very, very slow and painful. And in DevSpace, we have this hot reloading mechanism that updates everything while you're typing in your IDE. You folks have a lot of other open source. We cluster is a good example. There are so many other projects which you know helps you know build the cluster so how does uh, dev space kind of help with other you know our folks can leverage all these projects uh, you know with their workflows yeah that's an excellent question you know obviously vcluster and dev space uh, have their own use cases but they work really well uh, in combination for example we are actually developing vcluster with dev space and we're using vcluster in the development of dev space as well um, the interesting thing about this is, you know, vCluster solves the problem of, you know, creating your environments that you're using for development, um, but it doesn't really solve the part of how do you actually deploy your application once you have that Kubernetes environment. Um, so what you can technically do, and we do that internally, is we use vCluster to spin up a new virtual cluster for each of the projects that we work on, you know, whether it's DevSpace, or uh, vCluster or Kiosk or JS Policy um, or our commercial product Loft, each developer has a virtual cluster for each one of the projects that they're working on. And they can spin it up and tear it down with vCluster with a single click or command. And then Loft comes into play when they're actually starting to work, when they want to launch the debugger, launch the application, stand up the dependencies, and actually start that really good hot reloading workflow. Um, that's how the tools, uh, you know, fit in together. One more thing in the not only just cloud endeavor, you know, when we also talk about 
infrastructure is good is also repeatability. So, uh, you know, can you also talk about, you know, I mean, we can also talk about the feature and functionalities of version 6 or in general, if you can also just touch quickly about uh, the repeatability capabilities of uh, uh, DevSpace. Yeah, so in, in terms of, so everybody knows infrastructure as code. Um, what we're doing with DevSpace effectively is development workflows as code, right? So it's similar to what you're doing with Terraform. You're codifying what otherwise would be in a lengthy developer documentation or just in your head, right? When you are building applications today and you may do it with Docker Compose, you may do it with Kubernetes, it may not even be standardized across your team. Everybody kind of does their own little things, has their own little tricks to be more efficient building applications the way um, they want to build it. And what we're trying to enable engineering teams is to codify these best practices that they're developing into a DevSpace YAML file that is accessible for the entire team. So you can really, you know, you figure out a shortcut, you figure out a better way to do things, put it in your DevSpace YAML and the rest of your team will be able to use it. That's really the core idea of uh, using a tool like DevSpace. So can you talk about what's new in version six? Yeah, version six uh, makes DevSpace a lot more flexible Obviously, you know, it's been six versions <laughs> at this point. So we've seen a whole bunch of companies uh, adopt DevSpace. And one of the things that was missing so far was flexibility in terms of really customizing the inner logic of DevSpace. So far, we had a construct called, called hooks that allows you to hook into certain things that we do. But DevSpace has the strict workflow, right? It connects to your Kubernetes cluster, then it may build images if necessary, then it deploys the application, then it starts port forwarding, then it starts code synchronization, then it starts a debugger. You know, it was a very, very strict order so far, and you could hook into this order with these hooks uh, to run certain custom commands in between. But if you wanted to switch things up and say, hey, I want to deploy this first, and then I want to build something, then I want to deploy something else, and then I want to you know, start port forwarding, that custom order was not possible. With DevSpace version 6, we're introducing a feature called Pipelines, which essentially allows teams, uh, you know, they can use the out-of-the-box functionality. Migration from version 5 to 6 is very, very easy. We have default pipelines for everything. But if you want to customize what happens when you run a command like DevSpace Dev or DevSpace Deploy, you can entirely customize that now with a very familiar syntax because it's effectively just bash, but it's an emulated bash so that it actually you know, runs on every operating system, uh, works very, very smoothly on, on every different environment that an engineer may have, which is obviously very important to standardize things across teams. I think that's the biggest feature we're shipping. And the second biggest feature uh, that we're introducing is imports. Imports uh, allows teams to create DevSpace YAML files with shared functionality that they may need in all their projects. A lot of the teams that work with DevSpace have like, you know, 30, 60 plus different Git repositories. Obviously you need a DevSpace YAML file in each one of them. And if your company has certain things where they standardize on like certain ways to build images, certain ways that apply to Kubernetes, certain Helm charts, certain databases, right? You obviously wanna not repeat yourself, right? And you wanna kind of, define it in one place and then import it into all of these DevSpace YAML files. And that's possible now as well with version six. Another feature that we're adding uh, is uh, better integration with IDEs. So, so far um, you had to, you know, code with your local host IDE and the code was synchronized into uh, the remote containers that run in Kubernetes, which is great, but for some use cases, it's easier to just open the remote environment on your local machine directly and edit the remote files via SSH. Um, that's why we introduced uh, an SSH connection that gets injected into the development containers if you enable it. And that allows you to use, uh, for example, VS Code has a feature for connecting remote debug environments, right? So you have these remote development environments that you connect to. You can immediately start the debugger, uh, set breakpoints, without any complicated remote debugging setup, et cetera. 
which is a really great experience, you know, on top of what DevSpace already provides today. Uh, when we talk about Kubernetes, I hear this a lot, you know, the complexity is uh, there, plus cost is also becoming a very big, big factor. Now, uh, to offset that, there are, you know, folks are offering, you know, platform as a service, as a service is becoming popular, but the, 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 the problem that happens there is that it does not remain that flexible as you want to be. It starts to getting more and more opinionated. So you don't get the benefit that you want. Uh, so can you also talk about what are the challenges that you are seeing that comes with this complexity of Kubernetes, which might, you know, uh, affect, all, I mean, adoption is not going down, but it might, you know, affect a lot of folks who are looking at embracing Kubernetes. And how does DevSpace kind of maintain a balance between the, the flexibilities and you don't have to worry about the complexity? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think everybody knows Kubernetes uh, is, is pretty complex and it's really hard for, you know, engineers to uh, get a hold of Kubernetes in a way that, you know, they can actually just deploy the applications. That's why we've seen a recent wave, as you mentioned, of like platform as a service uh, companies, again, like building Heroku-like systems, but on top of Kubernetes. Um, I think that makes a ton of sense, uh, but I think what we're trying to do is not hide Kubernetes. And I think a lot of companies are trying uh, to do that. And I think that's a mistake because as soon as you're hiding Kubernetes, you're effectively taking away uh, that flexibility, as you said, right? And a lot of companies adopt Kubernetes because of that flexibility, portability uh, aspect of it. And I think uh, what we're trying to do with all the tools that we're building is we're trying to create abstractions that are transparent. So you can still see Kubernetes, you can still work with Kubernetes, you can still, you know, we don't tell you get rid of kubectl, DevSpace abstracts kubectl, right? Instead of having to run 20 kubectl commands, you can spin your up your application with a single DevSpace command. But if you need kubectl and you need to stream the logs yourself and you need to analyze the containers, you need to change something about your pods, you can still do that. DevSpace does not prevent you from doing that. And I think all the tools that we're building, including Loft, actually embrace direct access for engineers to Kubernetes because nothing is more frustrating for engineers than when they're getting stuck, that they can't access the system, you know, and that uh, that they need to debug. Um, so I think that's a really, really important part of it, building abstractions, but keeping these abstractions as transparent as possible so engineers can still do, uh, you know, dig deep if they need to uh, dive deeper. Can you also talk about uh, who is using it and what's capacity? If you can share some use cases, uh, that would be awesome too. We opened a Slack channel uh, last year and are slowly, you know, directing people into there instead of, you know, these one-on-one -on -one conversations or everything via GitHub issues. Uh, we see over 700 people in our Slack channel today. So it's been uh, pretty well received in, in our existing user base. There are, you know, a lot of unicorn companies uh, like Gusto, for example, is one of them, but also very established companies like Appen um, are using um, are using DevSpace. And obviously a lot of, <clears throat> you know, up, up and coming companies like a property tech startup, I think they're like a series B funded startup, HQO, uh, mm -hmm. they're using DevSpace as well. There's a ton of companies. Uh, obviously there are a lot of, you know, like bigger companies that we are not allowed to disclose that they're building their internal tooling on top of DevSpace. But it's really fascinating to see all of these companies uh, use DevSpace, extend DevSpace, and build things on top of DevSpace. A lot of the times we tell companies when they're looking into DevSpace, it, you know, it takes you 90% of where you need to be. And then you can still, you know, use the extensibility mechanisms. There's a plugin system for DevSpace, for example, if you actually need to customize something in the core extended beyond what we're allowing you to do in DevSpace YAML. And I think a lot of what we're doing in version six actually ties back to, you know, efforts to make it even easier and even fle more flexible for users to adjust uh, to their workflows. Obviously our goal is to, you know, make DevSpace the default uh, tool for Kubernetes development. And yeah, one of the big, big next steps for us is actually bringing DevSpace uh, to CNCF and making it a sandbox project. Uh, we're currently in the process of uh, doing that, but it will still take a you know a couple of months till that's actually out. What are the things that you are working? What is next in your pipeline or roadmap? Yeah, I think for DevSpace, uh, we're working on a 
deeper integration with IDEs. Uh, I think SSH, what we shipped in version six is a first step towards making it easier, you know, to use the IDE native features to connect your remote environments and use you know, browser-based IDEs and things like that. Um, but we wanna, we wanna go even deeper. We wanna work on plugins for the different IDEs. And another big uh, action item for us is to overhaul uh, the UI. We have a localhost UI that gives users a little bit of visibility into what have they deployed, how to stream the logs, right? Get an overview of the entire system, see all their microservices and their health status, et cetera. Um, but that UI, uh, you know, has been started two years ago. We've been adding and adding things to it, right? And it, I think it's a it's time for a clean uh, redesign of that UI. Um, potentially, that will be DevSpace version seven uh, <laughs> next year. We'll see. Um, maybe we'll ship it just as a minor version in between. Depends on how big that change will actually be and how much, uh, you know, that will affect users in the end in terms of having to relearn a different UI, uh, but it's definitely a priority item for us as well. You mentioned next year. So do you have a release cadence for these releases or you release it as and when it's ready? Yeah, we set release dates uh, depending on when we have like bigger features. Obviously we continuously do patch releases for minor fixes or, you know, uh, small things, small improvements. Um, but for the bigger features, we typically plan about, you know, four weeks ahead. Um, because we want to make sure that customers have a chance to test a better version, uh, ship that out first, make sure that we reach out to them, ask for feedback um, before we actually do a final release. Uh, for version six, that was actually even more than that. Uh, we had it in beta for two months uh, just to make sure that, you know, existing customers have a really smooth experience while upgrading. That's always really important for us. We really don't want to break your internal developer tooling, even though we tell you, you know, this is a new major version, and that typically means breaking changes. We try to reduce the breaking changes to a minimum. So actually teams, you know, even with 300 plus engineers working on DevSpace every day can upgrade within a matter of hours uh, rather than, you know, getting stuck in between. As we're talking about day two operations initially, the thing is with open source projects, uh, day one is easy part. You get the product, download it from GitHub repository, uh, get it started using it. Day two is where the main challenge where you need additional features, functionality, support, security. Uh, so can you also talk about how do you kind of, and also commercialization of open source is also important. So talk about in terms of dev space itself, how folks can, you know, be rest assured that, hey, it's not just an open source project that we have to deal with on our own. What what what? What is LAF doing to help those users and potential customers? Yeah, what we provide uh, to support, especially large enterprises, uh, which need you know uh, immediate help if uh, they're hitting roadblocks, um, is that we actually support uh, provide support contracts. We provide enterprise support for DevSpace. Um, that means you have a dedicated account manager on our end. Uh, we you know connect via uh, Microsoft Teams or via Slack. Uh, to your engineers directly, give them a path to reach out to us whenever, you know, something goes wrong or they are unsure uh, what to do. Um, and I think that's really important for a lot of companies to have that reliable partner. And obviously we are the maintainers of that project. So uh, we have a lot of really deep knowledge and can share a lot of things that we've seen at other companies, share a lot of best practices to get companies, uh, you know, up to speed with that space very, very quickly in the beginning but also help them continuously maintain and upgrade uh, to different versions of dev space, et cetera. Uh, it's definitely very, very important for, for a lot of companies. Lucas, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about dev space and also uh, how you folks are helping some of the major challenges, pain points of those who wants to uh, leverage Kubernetes without having to compromise all this flexibility. So thanks for sharing those insights. And as usual, we'd love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Absolutely, it was a pleasure. Anyone who wants to learn more, www.devspace.sh is the right resource to find, you know, our Slack channel, our Git repository and more. Thanks a lot, Swapnil.